My name is Sharon Slavinsky. I'm a professor at Western University, and I'm the director of the Creative Arts and Production Program, which we call the CAP program for short, which is the launch that we're celebrating tonight. CAP is a unique program at Western University. Our students come from three different faculties. Faculty of Information and Media Studies, that's my home base, the Don Wright Faculty of Music, and the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. And students complete the CAP program while working towards another major in their home program. That might seem like a complicated structure, and as a director who works across three faculties, I can tell you that's true, it is a complicated structure. But that's because we deliberately set out to create a program that at its heart is committed to collaboration. And in fact, the program has three key pillars. Collaboration, <clears throat> community, and creativity. We believe that these three principles are the skills and ideas that students need to be able to make a more just, a more beautiful, and a more cooperative world. So on that note, I'd like to make a few acknowledgements tonight. I will try to keep it very short. I know you're here to see Chris and Emma. But please bear with me as I give some language and breath to things that need acknowledgement. First, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which we're gathered tonight, the land on which we depend, the land which provides us with the gift of life. This beautiful museum is located on the forks of the Antler River, the Dashkan Zibi, and the traditional territories of many indigenous people, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenapewak, and the Chan'anketong nations. When we were planning our launch, we couldn't think of a better location for the, for the launch of the CAP program. We are all treaty people. The treaties that govern this land include the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the District One Spoon Covenant Wampum, if you've studied these treaties, I think you'll agree with me that they are some of our most progressive governance documents. And in the spirit of acknowledging the treaties that govern our land and the collective communities, I wish all to also acknowledge that today is the global shutdown for Palestine. Uh, it's been called for today on November 9th. Part of me wishes that we could all just kind of get up and do a walkout in solidarity. But as the organizers of that movement have said, and they've made clear, speaking out is also an action. So I would like to use this occasion to publicly express my personal solidarity with the movement for a free Palestine. I wish to also acknowledge the incredible staff at Museum London for their warm hospitality and their considerable labor in putting this event together. Special thanks to Julie Bevan. I don't know if Julie's here yet the Executive Director of Museum London. Linda O'Connor, the Head of Marketing and Development, who spent an hour with our students, half an hour with our students, the CAP students, answering questions about uh, the work that she does for the museum on a field visit. And Lisa McDougall, the fantastic events coordinator who tracked every detail of this event with admirable precision. I also wish to acknowledge Josh Lambier. Josh is behind. Uh, Josh is the artistic director of the Words Festival, who is our co-host tonight. Josh's singular efforts to create and maintain space for important public conversations in this city is truly unparalleled. Thank you, Josh. All right, on to the main event. You are in for a real treat. Neither Chris Rolston nor Emma Donahue need any introduction in this town, but for the, uh, they are rarely seen on stage together. <laughs> The occasion that has brought us this fortuitous event is the twin publication of their two books about the remarkable Anne Lister, famous for producing one of, if not the longest diary in the English language, for her ingenuity as a woman landowner in the 19th century, and for her dozens of affairs with women, uh, including a historic wedding to Anne Walker in 1834. Uh, she was also known to, be, to, to wear all black, I think. Yes, and this is my Anne Lister cosplay for tonight. It's as close as I could get, given my wardrobe. I should have borrowed my friend as a top hat. That would have been excellent. Okay, Chris, <laughs> Chris and Emma spoke about their work at the London Public Library earlier this summer, and I realized then that this double act would be the perfect way to launch the CAP program. Discussion touches on community, collaboration, and of course, creativity. I will hand off the proper introduction of our guests to one of our CAP students, Santiago Rivera. Wait. <laughs> But I just want to invite you to join us after the talk at a reception, which will be held downstairs in the gorgeous room that looks out over the river. We have wonderful food prepared by Northmore Catering, which is the same 
um, company that uh, handles craft pharmacy, so what better way to build community than good food? Uh, in the atrium, the Western Bookstore has set up a quite elaborate table with almost all of Emma's books, uh, which you can purchase tonight, as well as the new novel, Learned by Heart. Uh, Emma has graciously agreed to sign books tonight as well, so there'll be time for that in the atrium immediately after the event. You can have a glass of wine, come back up, get a book signed, it's wonderful. Okay, last but certainly not least, while you're enjoying the food and drink, please take a moment to take in the slides that will be projected on the south wall of the reception area. We've arranged for a little mini digital exhibition of some of our CAP student work, and specifically that was an assignment that it was in my class to create uh, digital self-portraits. There are many of these students here tonight. Uh, CAP students, do you want to give a wave, a shout? There they are. <laughs> I am sure they'll be very happy to speak with you about your work and about the program uh, at the reception afterwards. Okay, thank you once again for coming and for your presence this evening. And here is Santiago to introduce our guests. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Santiago, and like Sharon said, uh, I'm a part of the CAP program. I've been in CAP for the last um, three years, I would say. And it actually was quite ironic because I wasn't supposed to be in CAP. I was originally enrolled in criminology, and I, I was like, what? What is CAP? And I got so um, intrigued by it when I first saw that email. They're like, Western's offering a new program really cool because I started university with the image that I wasn't going to be able to bring that part of creativity that I've always carried with myself and that's what led me to going into criminology and I took a class called introduction to sexuality and the professor leading that class was Chris Rose and yes round of applause <laughs> and I don't I don't know if Chris knows, but she has a really big part in why I switched programs into gender, sexuality, women's studies. And I'm very thankful that I was able to take it in a dual degree. And this year, um, I'm in the creative research class with Sharon and taking lesbian lives and culture with Chris Rolston. And I, believe it or not, I think this is the year where I've felt the most smart in my entire university <laughs> career. I, I've never felt so passionate and being able to link two, th two things together, which is academia and creativity, is totally so fulfilling for us as students that are trying to figure things out. And being able to do that, it really does, it does inspire us. And when we had our creative research class, we, were enter we, we started reading Learn by Heart, and I went into class, um, it was my lesbian lives, uh, lesbian lives and Culture class with Chris, and I put my book aside, and I, and then Chris saw it, and then she's like, oh, you're reading the book, and I'm like, yeah, I am, I'm reading the book, and I was just so, so pleased, because what Emma and Chris are doing is that they're bridging the world of creativity, academia, and history, and that's what us students love to see, because we are, we're learning to do those, those things. And it's truly inspiring what they are doing because it's not commonly seen. Like people don't really acknowledge it and we wanna make it present as CAP students. And we're the first big class of it. And our goal is to ensure people know what CAP is and that we're present. And I'm really fortunate and really thankful for the opportunity to be here. And I wanna give a big shout out to my classmates, because this year we've been able to collaborate more, we've been able to talk more and just like feel that we're doing the right thing. And with that, I wanna thank Emma and Chris for being here and doing this. And without further ado, I wanna introduce you guys to Emma Donahue and Chris Rolston.
Hello all, very nice to have such a warm home crowd. I don't know, I feel a bit like a rock star on a stool. I don't know. Um, anyway, Santiago, thank you so much for that delightful introduction. And it is really wonderful to be part of the launch of the CAP program and to share in WordsFest and to have that, that combination. We're really honored to have been invited to this evening to speak. So um, tonight we are going to speak, of course, about Anne Lister. And, uh, you know, I have a bit of a confession. We're completely obsessed with her. Um, and in fact, Emma introduced me to Anne Lister in the 1990s. It's sort of how we got together. So she's kind of the third person in our relationship, which may not be the healthiest thing, I don't know, but we're, you know, nearly 30 years on, so. Um, Emma had written a play about Anne Lister in the 1990s, and on and off, we've talked about Anne Lister, uh, we've researched Anne Lister, I've published on Anne Lister, but it was sort of coincidence that this summer, both of our books came out at the same time, and that was, that was really lovely. Um, my book is a book of essays by scholars and also interviews by Sally Wainwright and Helena Whitbread, who um, who have been involved with, um, with Anne Lister, Sally Wainwright created Gentleman Jack, Helena Whitbread is the first independent scholar to really bring Lister to the light. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm very proud of the book, I'm, I'm very pleased that it's out. It's the first collection of essays on Anne Lister to come out. And of course, Emma's wonderful novel, Learn by Heart, which is based also on Anne Lister, but it's based on her early days in boarding school. And in fact, today, um, what we really want to focus on is Anne Lister, yes, but also Eliza Rain, who was Anne Lister's first lover um, when they were both 15 at boarding school. So I think at this point, most of you know a little bit about Lister. I will just say a couple more words to add to what Sharon said. Um, Lister, of course, has written this extraordinary diary, but what's his interest? Interesting to me in some ways is that the diary was um, a source of shame and embarrassment for over a hundred years. Um, it, was dis it was discovered at the end of the 19th century by a descendant of Anne Lister because it was hidden away and uh, Anne Lister was traveling and that's, she actually died while traveling. Uh, she was being an adventurous traveler. She was in the Russian Caucasus, which is now Georgia. That's where she died, and the diaries were hidden back at home in, um, in Yorkshire. And when John Lister discovered the diaries, 15% um, of the content was code. And the code um, was, you know, it was fairly sophisticated. It was sort of Greek symbols and numbers. Anyway, he managed to decode the code with an antiquarian friend. But when they realized what the code said, they were so shocked that they put the diaries back in the closet. And there they stayed until Shibden Hall became the property of Halifax Town Council. And then, so the code was available at that point. It was, it was in the archive. And um, a couple of scholars, uh, female scholars, went to the archive, looked at the material, published selections of the diaries, but did not go near the coded sections. So it wasn't until 1988 that Helena Whitbread who really, she's the mother of Anne Lister studies, um, published the coded, some of the coded sections of the diaries with Virago Press. And just to give you a sense of how radical that was, um, many people thought it was a hoax. They did not think an early 19th century woman could possibly, possibly write what she wrote about her affairs with women, the explicitness with which she wrote about sex and sexuality at a time really when um, women were not supposed to talk about sex. And they, they really, they talked about emotions, they talked about sentiment, but, but sex, you know, they, they weren't supposed to acknowledge that they had a sexuality. And Anne Lister just kind of blew that right open and we've had to really revise what we think about the history of sexuality in that, in that era, especially in relationship to, to women. Anyway, I'll pass you over to Emma to talk about Eliza Rain. Sure, just on the code, um... I brought a mug. Um, this mug shows not only the code, feel free to come up and examine it later, 
Um, but it, it shows what happens when you gradually start becoming a pop culture icon. Um, <clears throat> when Chris and I first got involved um, with Anne Lister, she was the most specialist topic, you know, and now they've got mugs of her code. So obviously we feel slightly irritated at having to share with a wide community of collaborators, but also, and more importantly, we are thrilled that there are lots more people who know about Anne Lister now. So um, yeah, my, my own special focus um, in, in returning to Anne Lister after this long stretch, after I, I, I wrote a play based on that first volume of her diaries um, back in the 90s, um, but I always wondered why nobody was writing about her very first relationship with Eliza Rain. So Eliza Rain was born the same year as Anne Lister, 1791, but in Madras, India, she's one of the hundreds and hundreds of children of the East India Company, meaning um, that the, the English and Scottish men who went out and worked for the East India Company in Britain, such as William Rain, um, who was a surgeon, uh, they, they formed very marital style partnerships with Indian women and had lots and lots and lots of children. And Eliza Rain is one of those children. And she was, she was Englished, as they say, at the age of six. Her father sent her off to England, the homeland she'd never seen, at the age of six with her older sister and with no parent. And she was then in boarding schools in London and in York. So culturally, Eliza Rain went through that very weird experience of being absolutely ripped away from her, her home and from one side of her. And her Indian family was not only lost to her, but is lost to us in that we don't know her mother's name, for instance, or anything about her mother's ethnic group or religion or anything or where she was from, because her mother only shows up in the archives in his accounts as Dr. Rain's woman, like she was chattel. So Eliza was orphaned very early. So um, she, she was in a boarding school in, in York, at the Manor School in York, um, in 1805, when she found herself sharing an attic room, the only room for two girls rather than a group, with another outsider who was Anne Lister, differently outsider. So yeah, what I've, what I've ended up writing about in this novel is, is the two of them at 14 um, encountering each other in York. And I think Eliza Rain is just as interesting, but unlike Anne Lister, she did not get the chance to write a big diary or travel or do anything much. She had a much more constrained and tragic life. So I think with writing fiction, you're always hoping to in some way supplement the archives and, and make up for, for injustices that happened. So this book is my attempt to, to let Eliza Rain step into the light um, alongside Anne Lister. Right, and it's also um, the part of the archive that is the, the least documented and did that help in terms of it, it did it's, it's perverse you know sources are really stimulating to me um, I love using historical sources about real people but um, I remember when I wrote my novel Life Mask which was about rich fancy people in the 1790s they left so many published sources that I was you know just overwhelmed by them especially Horace Walpole he wrote maybe 20 letters every morning before breakfast and because he wasn't a scandalous 19th century lesbian his book, his letters have been published in full in multiple volumes. So I was just like, oh, too many sources. The ideal source really is a fragmentary one when you're talking about fiction. So um, yeah, I, I chose to, I didn't want to write something that was a kind of a, you know, um, uh, paraphrasing of the diaries. So as Anne Lister only began the diary seriously in her 20s. And so what I'm writing about is a year from which we have nothing but, I think we have, we have, um, uh, one or two letters from Anne Lister to her family before that, a um, couple of notes about, you know, where she was, when, and then we have later letters between Anne Lister and Eliza Rain reminiscing about their school days. So yeah, we don't have any direct sources about that year they spent at school together, which made it kind of per perfect for my purposes. Right. Um, and the novel is set in two locations, the boarding school and the asylum. And um, you, you switch point of view, use third person for the boarding school, first person for the asylum. Could you talk a bit about why you decided to do that and, and what it brings to the novel? Sure. Um, it's, it's funny, with, with writing most novels, the bit that takes longest is years and years of going past tense or present tense, third person or first person. <laughs> you know, these very tradecraft decisions. And um, one reason this novel has taken me, in a sense, about 33 years to write, if I counted from when I first got interested in Anne Lister, 
is that I didn't know how to approach it because I knew I didn't want it to be a baggy biographical novel, which would in any way attempt to recount the full lives of these two women, especially as they were only together at 14. So I didn't want it to do that, but nor could I just leave out everything that came later. So I decided ultimately to, to keep the novel very circumscribed within the boarding school and, and to follow the rules of sort of boarding school fiction, you know, whether literary novels like um, 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 uh, Olivia is a famous one or, or very genre ones like the Mallory Towers books, they all stay within the school. They don't follow the, the kids home on weekends or holidays or anything. They, they stay locked up as it were. So I decided the novel would do that, but I also had to give some sense of how Eliza's future wasn't the one that she dreamed of that year. Otherwise, the whole thing would have been, you know, falsely happy. So I decided to create a kind of a frame device of letters, they're f fictional letters that she's sending from a small private asylum that she has checked herself into, like just, just a mile down the road in York in 1815. And so I thought that way I would get you know, there are pros and cons to third and first person. So first person has that wonderful immediacy. And especially when it's letters, the epistolary form is very rich as such because it always creates this interest in the readers of like, okay, who's getting this letter? Who's reading it? How do they respond? Why aren't they writing back? So it's, it's a form that sort of draws you in. Um, but keeping up first person is very difficult for a historical character because you have to make sure that every word is one that they would be likely to use or else it's going to sound anachronistic. Um, so for the boarding school sections, I went for third person because third person lets you sort of perch on somebody's shoulder. You only show what's happening that they see in the rooms they are in, but you can have that little bit of distance between you and them. You can sometimes, you know, gently critique their behavior or gently make fun of them by, by just having a little bit more distance than first person would give you. And you don't have to use only the words that they would be likely to say. So I didn't have to say to myself, would Eliza know that word at 14? Um, so, so I found going between the, the boarding school and the asylum, uh, structurally, in terms of the book, it was a good way to, to tinker with the tonal balance. Um, I find very often books are very quick to draft, but then I go through all the way going, oh, a bit too happy, a bit too sad. Um, so, so, you know, I wanted the, the boarding school love affair to be genuinely, very radiantly happy, because that's certainly how they remembered it. Um, Eliza's letters, uh, for instance, you know, she's always saying things like, York was where my sun rose and where it set. So, you know, she herself framed the whole thing as like, those were my, my glory days. Um, and so I wanted the novel to follow her in having that kind of nostalgic yearning frame. And that way I could let the happy bits be very happy and let the two of them be very sort of idealistic. They say things like, you know, the year we were 14, we invented love. You know, I wanted them to feel that. And so putting a, a sadder frame around it allowed me to let the happy bits be very happy. Um, I, I'm in a relationship to that. Uh, so the boarding school is, is this closed micro world. Um, it really is a world unto itself. But clearly, Eliza and Lister inhabited it in slightly different ways, in the sense that um, Eliza seems to have needed that school for the rest of her life in a way Lister didn't. So why do you think that is? Well, Anne Lister was this uber confident, you know, cocky intellectual basically she was already learning you know she was like you <laughs> and i have put certain autobiographical incidents directly into the novel you'd be surprised how much autobiography you can put in historical fiction for instance i was much mocked at my dublin convent school as dictionary donahue so i decided that she would be lexicon lister um, um and so i um Sorry, sorry, the boarding school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Lister was highly confident. She'd been to other schools. She sometimes studied at home. And, and she, she implied that really she'd go to school just temporarily to pick up a few skills or a few social connections. But, you know, she had a home life as well um, in, the, in the Yorkshire Walds. Eliza Rain had nowhere else to go, had nothing else. She had a guardian there in York, but he didn't want her to come live with him full time. She had a sister she didn't get on with. She was completely cut off from her entire Indian family, and she never mentioned it in her, in her letters, except once um, well, she makes one reference uh, to India. When she sees a German refugee in the street, she says something about, like, oh, I feel for those who've lost their homeland. And then she zips it on the subject again. Um, so she's, she's orphaned in every sense. In one of her letters, she refers to having a widowed, orphaned heart. 
So she needed that school. And in her letter, she sounds desperate for the approval of her teachers. And she sounds quite anxious about, oh, my master is, visit is visiting. I must get my homework done. And I must stay on until Christmas because the headmistress wants me to. So she's desperate to please because, frankly, if you're the one non-white face in the school, you can't afford to break any of the rules. She sounds at every point like, I must be perfectly beautiful, refined, genteel, intelligent, and, you know, law-abiding, or else, you know, or else I'm in trouble. So she had none of Anne Lester's, frankly, entitlement. Um, so, yeah, their, their stakes in the school were totally different. And even though Eliza Rain had money, she had 4,000 pounds in the bank, which no Jane Austen heroine ever had, money on its own was not enough within Regency society to give you a feeling of confidence because you couldn't do anything with the money unless you were obeying the social rules. And Eliza Rain sounds really anxious. So I think it's no wonder that she then looked back on this boarding school year as like, oh, that's the year I finally felt loved. That's the year I finally thought I had a happy future. You know, the two of them planned as soon as, as, as Eliza would inherit her money at 21, they were planning to head to Europe, you know, live in Italy, live free. Um, but there's seven long years between 14 and 21. And, you know, not many of us managed to keep at 21 the girlfriend we had at 14. So basically, the, the delay in getting the money, I would say, is, is what, one thing that thwarted them. Um, so, so anyway, yeah, they, 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 the school meant a very different thing to them. Um, quite apart from uh, Chris's edited collection on Anne Lister, she did an essay on Eliza Rain, and this is the point during COVID lockdown that she and I particularly merged. I mean, we usually have much better boundaries, right? We usually each talk to each other at lunch about what we've been working on, but it's not usually the same thing. But she started doing a, an in-depth essay about Eliza Rain and Anne Lister, and at that point we were just, you know, jumping together down the rabbit hole. And I think our teenagers thought <laughs> we'd, really, we'd really got lost in a private obsession. Um, so can I ask you, you, Chris, what was it about the Eliza Rain part of Anne Lister's life and the boarding school in particular that drew you? I should start by outing Chris as a boarding school girl in, um, uh, in, in real life, which I think gives her a personal stake in the whole thing. Yeah, I, I went to boarding school for seven years in England. And... Um, I always think if I'd met Emma there, I probably wouldn't have liked her, actually. <laughs> so Dictionary Donahue's better. I met you in my 30s. Um, yeah, so, I, so I'm actually working on a, on a book on, on, on boarding school novels. And so my attraction to, to that part of the um, Lister Diaries was the whole idea of the boarding school and, and how it, even though it's, it's an institution, um, it's, it's very normative, it's very controlled, somehow it creates the possibility for these sexual relationships between the, the students, between girls. And all the boarding school novels that I've been researching, they're all about this kind of same-sex attraction that takes place. And so I, I got very interested with, um, with Eliza and, um, and Lister about how within this context of constraint and rules, how did they manage to move from that kind of homosocial friendship model to a sexual model? Um, and I think, I think it's because female friendships were so encouraged at the time. They were so allowed, uh, they were so possible, that it was actually surprisingly easy to slip into something else if that was what you wanted to do. Um, and so there, there's a weird freedom within boarding school space, which seems very contradictory. But, but that is what really interested me when I was, when I was thinking about the, the Eliza Rain um, and Anne Lister sort of romance. Am I right? You also really found it interesting how, you know, how, how gappy the archive is, right? We know so much less about Eliza Rain because Anne Lister only starts the diaries later on. She's already always looking back going, oh, poor Eliza. I visited poor Eliza. I thought about beautiful Eliza, the most beautiful girl I ever met. So, so it was very sort of tantalizingly um, undocumented. Yes, absolutely. And, and one of the other things I'm very interested in is how do we document a history that's invisible? And really, gay and lesbian history, queer history is not documented. It, it's, it's never been part of the history books. And so you have to kind of find it, you have to excavate it, you have to look for it, and you have to decide that it's there. Um, and that can seem somewhat fictional, but that's part of the pleasure, I think. It's, you bring the question to the past, and the past often answers you. 
you know, if you look for the right part of the archive, you get surprising answers. Um, and so I'm really interested in, in queer history as, on the one hand, a gap that, that needs to be filled, but also a, a kind of tantalizing impossibility at the same time. And so that's where my love of nostalgia comes in, I think. I mean, to give one really um, well-known example, um, um, Michel Foucault said that the, the rules of institutions, for instance, the rules in boys' schools that said no two boys are to share a bed, you know, that is a kind of a negative evidence that boys were sharing beds and having sex because they would never have bothered to ban it otherwise. So sometimes you can read between those lines. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, in some, some boarding schools, you know, they, they controlled female friendships by, you know, you weren't allowed to walk with a girl older than you, or there couldn't be more than two of you in a group and an older girl as a chaperone. So there was definite awareness of that kind of, you know, the erotics of, of boarding school life, even though it was never explicitly revealed or talked about, the rules, as you say, made it clear that it was part, part of that world. The, the elaborate rules of boarding schools, and you know, mostly boys' schools relied on violence, and girls' schools relied on elaborate um, supervision and sort of surveillance. Uh, for instance, you know, I didn't know what the particular rules of the manor school were. Um, I knew who ran it. It was a sort of French Huguenot family, but I didn't know what the, the details of their pedagogy or the rules were. So I, I read accounts of many other boarding schools for young women in this period, and I would sort of pluck all the most arcane little rules, like um, one of them said, um, if you would be, if you committed some infraction, you would have to wear the belt color of the junior class. I'm thinking, it didn't actually make anyone think you were a junior, but maybe you went through the whole week going like, oh God, I'm wearing blue, it's so humiliating. Or if you took three slices of bread at lunch, nobody would stop you, but you were only allowed one slice at dinner. So there are all sorts of little consequences and demerits that you could then work off with merits. And sometimes you could get into sort of homework debt. Like if you, mostly memorizing, learning by heart um, was the main technique. Um, I would have found it hideous. You'd, you'd have to memorize, let's say, a page of Dr. Johnson's dictionary. And then if you failed to regurgitate it the next day, they'd give you another page to learn. And so you'd end up maybe 10 pieces of, of homework memorization in debt. Um, so I, I found all these rules fascinating because in a way, I'm trying to write about early 19th century society, and it was known for its arcane rules. And if you go for a miniature version of that, it really highlights the absurdity because the stakes are so low. Um, so in a way, by writing just about the manor school, I got to write about British society in general and all the little sort of terrors of getting it wrong. Like, we mustn't stand too near the windows because then a boy could see us. Or if you nod to a boy in the street, he has to be your cousin for instance, or it's not legitimate. Um, just so many little rules. Um, and that made it a perfect kind of, you know, absurd miniature version of society. Um, you actually went to the location of the manor school as part of your research. Well, one reason I got around to writing this book was that um, Chris and I went to York for a few months back in 1998. And um, I was a writer in residence at the University of York, but Chris was a fellow at the Center for 18th Century Studies, which was in some lovely old building called King's Manor. And we realized in week one, that was the building where Anne Lister's boarding school was. Um, the boarding school shared the, the, the gigantic rambling building with, with other um, workshops and um, um, uh, they had a granary in the ballroom. It was a very multi-purpose building, but yeah, Chris had an office right there. Maybe they had sex in my office. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Um, we, we know from Eliza's first two writings in her own hand are lists of the girls in each school that she's in. A classic, I think, testimony to a nervous kid is like, write down the names of everybody and who's who and whose sisters with who and who's from the same town as who. Um, so, so we know that she and Anne Lister were in a room called the Slope, which implies an attic room, and that there were only two of them in it, but we don't know which one is the Slope. One thing we did find when we, we, we went back in 2015 and um, with some braver friends, we managed to kind of, uh, you know, poke our way around King's Manor quite a lot. And in one of the rooms, um, there are many bits of graffiti on the, on the windows, on the tiny little panes. And the graffiti are almost all um, girls saying what, what teachers they love, girls saying what girls they love. Um, one, one little bit of graffiti says, shun all men. You know? <laughs> so it's a kind of lesbian graffiti archive, you know, hundreds of them from the 1700s through to the 1900s. And one of them I use as the epigraph for the book because I just loved the idea of this kind of 
you know, these little illicit writings because they were writing on something as hard as glass that it would, it would last all the way. And those are still now there now. You can visit York. Yeah, that is such a cool detail. Um, I'm just going to ask you one more question. Um, I just want to ask you about your author's note because it's one of the most substantial you've ever written. It's, it's, it's really long and really, well, really interesting. And I'm, I'm wondering what made you want to provide so much information. And if you could also talk a little bit about the volunteer transcription project that, that helped you in your research. Yeah, actually, I'm going to start with that. One reason for writing a long author's note was to say thanks to so many people because this novel is really partly crowdsourced. And because Anne Lister has become such a pop culture icon, on my recent tour in Halifax, somebody gave me a crocheted Anne Lister. Um, isn't that gorgeous? By the way, the real Anne Lister did not wear a top hat. But because for the Gentleman Jack TV show, they decided a top hat would be a good way to sort of clarify what a masculine vibe she had. Now everybody thinks of her as the top hat wearer. So at Shipton Hall, her house, um, fans were turning up and saying, where's the top hat? So the curators had to just buy a top hat and put it on the bed. And now fans rush into that bedroom and try on Anne Lister's top hat. So this is how becoming a pop culture icon starts to distort the sources. Because soon it'll be absolutely an accepted thing that she was known as Gentleman Jack and wore a top hat, none of which were true in her lifetime. But anyway, great doll. Um, so, um, yes, um, I needed, uh, this was during lockdown, and, and the main source I needed were the letters between Anne Lister and Eliza Rain. Uh, already the diaries, which should have been published properly by University Press decades ago, they hadn't been, but the fans of Gentleman Jack, the TV show, stepped in and hundreds of them signed up as Lister sisters or code breakers and transcribed the diaries um, under the supervision of the West Yorkshire Archive Service, a page at a time, and put them online, which was wonderful. But the, the letters were not available yet, and I reached out to that community, and 14 of them signed up to transcribe all the letters for me and put them on a database. And so I would like log on every morning in lockdown, and there would be another letter from Eliza coming at me as if after a postal delay of two centuries. I've never been so excited to log onto a database. Um, and I'm hugely grateful to these women and to so many people who helped me. Um, there's one Irish genealogist, um, San Ricken, who I reached out to with one query about Eliza's Guardian. And she was so good at finding, you know, obscure sources to do with addresses and taxes and, and wills that I harassed her for a full year. I kept writing back and saying, you've been so helpful already. I just have one final question. <laughs> I swear to God, went on for a year. She, she wrote to me one day and said, I found a letter from their teacher, Miss Lewin. Are you interested? And, and this letter showed not only, it gave a full description of the school and the fact that there was a pig living in one of the rooms in the school. And um, the letter also revealed casually that Miss Lewin had moved north from London with her female partner when she took up the job. I would not have thought to invent either the pig or the lesbian teacher, but I was delighted to have them provided to me. And really, I would not have found any of these things myself. I'm not that good a researcher. Um, so having, having a, an entire scholarly community made up of fans and academics and TV writers like Sally Wainwright, it's, it's such a widespread community at this point and, and has been so helpful to me. So the other reason I always write a big author's note is ethics. And um, when I'm writing historical fiction, I really sweat over the ethics of taking somebody long dead and making up a voice for them. I always fret over this. And especially if they're not well known, like if, you, if you're writing about Shakespeare, it's like, ah, there are many different Shakespeare's, don't worry about it. But if you're writing about Eliza Rain or any of the obscure people I've written about who are not well known now, feel this huge obligation to get it right and also to, to show your sources so that others can do their own versions. Because I'm not trying to, you know, possess any of these lives that I write about. I, I'm thrilled when people write to me and say, you know, um, that, that woman you wrote a short story about, I've now done a play about her, you know? So I always try and show my sources because I, I get so much help from others that equally I want my books to be really useful stepping stones for others to do their own work. Um, so yeah, I think it's just absolutely compulsory um, to, to share your work in that way. Uh, and, you know, those who don't want to read the history stuff can always skip it. So I, I always, you know, put it in its own box at the end, as it were, as a historical note. But, but that's the only way that the whole thing feels ethically um, okay to me, is to, to, to show the sources so that people can, can follow up with these things themselves and write their own versions. And um, I just want to add that um, as of June 2023, 
2.7 million of the 5 million words have been transcribed online. Amazing. So we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah, it's funny. For decades, we were like, oh, when will a university press do this? And then courtesy of the internet and crowdsourcing and that kind of wiki mentality, um, you know, this is all happening outside of the academy, though involving many academics. And um, Chris well, has been involved in setting up the Analyster Society, for instance. There's also an Analyster Birthday Week. Um, for every oh, that year is a April. lot of fun. Yeah. And, you know, these events will, will have sometimes, uh, you know, scholars there and also cosplayers. So I don't actually know of any fandom like this where the fans are actually helping to get the things written and where the fans are actually helping to, to dig up buried facts rather than just sort of passively waiting for a cultural product. So it's, yeah, it's the most kind of virtuous uh, feedback loop of a fandom that I've, that I've encountered. Well, I, I think that also is what makes you know, the, the, the Anlister story so appropriate for CAP because it really is this incredible collaboration between members of the public, creatives, fans, and academics to bring the Lister story into the world. So, you know, from the TV series to the Anlister birthday week to academic essays to novels, um, she, she sort of spans the, the, the cultural spectrum, I think, in, in really wonderful ways. I don't know what she'd think of this if she were alive. I think she'd be pretty well, pleased. One great thing about writing about her at 14 was that I didn't have to assume she would have the same opinions as when she was in her 40s. I mean, she ended up as a landowner and had the mentality of that class, right? So she went around bullying her tenants into voting Tory, for instance. Um, so I didn't have to make her be a high Tory at 14. Um, I figured she would, some qualities are lifelong, so she, I felt she would always be chatty and intellectually curious and physically energetic um, and, and libidinal, but she didn't always have to have conservative views, especially when she was 14 and madly in love with Eliza Rain. Absolutely. Um, I think we're... I, I think we should open it up to questions now yeah. because I know this audience is going to have some interesting things to say and ask. First, we have to thank our guests, yes? Dead. This is my new like dream. My goal is to be turned into a crochet doll. <laughs> life, life goals. New life goals. Okay, so uh, we have quite a bit of time, and in fact, our guests requested some extra time for questions um, on the spirit of collaboration, community, and creativity. Uh, I know some of my students have questions because we prepared them this week. Um, so uh, I, I open the floor for questions, and I'm looking at you, <laughs> Josiah. Wait, we have a, okay, so we have a microphone. Josh is going to run the microphone. We have about 150 people on Zoom from all over the world, so um, please wait. Hello, Hello Zoomers. <laughs> Hello, Zoomers. That was why we had a last minute costume change around the stage, but um, go ahead, Josiane. Pressure, okay. Um, so we had this, we had a conversation about this in class, but I wanted to get your opinion on it, um, and I think a lot of us might actually appreciate that. Um, do you think that, Eliza's like madness and craziness was solely in, impacted or like solely created and um, because of Anne Lister like do you think her um, emotional struggles came simply just because of Lister or do you think her um, past and um, family situation kind of impacted that as well? Okay. Um, yeah, that's a great question. You know, it's, it's very hard to, to sort of reconstruct um, w why Eliza ended up uh, in, in the asylum. But I think, I think it was a, a combination of, of factors. And there's no question that her, her deracination, right, her being sort of ripped away from her home in India at, at the age of, of six. And, you know, the voyage took like eight months right, to, to get to England. Um, and she was essentially an orphan because her father had died earlier and her mother essentially no longer existed as far uh, as Eliza was, was concerned because she would never see her again. Um, and so there, I think there was this fundamental sense of isolation that, that Eliza w 
was always experiencing. And I think that's partly why she got so attached to the school, because the school became very much her family. And then she fell in love with Ann Lister. And, you know, I, I think the, the emotional intensity of that um, would have consumed her entirely. So when Ann Lister started to pull away, it probably would have been very, very hard in some ways to, to survive that in terms of sort of mental health or psychological stability. So I, I, think, I think the two factors would play into that. I don't think any girlfriend drives you mad, um, even though it can feel like that at the time. Um, uh, and, you know, even a girlfriend who could be said to string you along. I mean, you know, the only bad thing Ann Lister did, I would say, was, you know, she should perhaps have broken with Eliza a bit more definitely. There's a moment um, in their early 20s when Eliza moves to Halifax, Anne's hometown, to be near her, and Anne sort of stays away for the winter on one pretext or another, mostly staying in York with Eliza's guardian. So I think, I think in her behavior, Anne Lister could have been a bit clearer about, no, we're finished now. But equally, Eliza was the kind of girlfriend you can't shake off, because at one point, Anne Lister seemed to be pairing up with a woman called Isabella Norcliffe, and Eliza writes to them in an abject spirit and basically says to Anne, I know you and Eliza are the main couple, you're meant to be together, but maybe I could just live with you two as your housemate. And I'm reading this thinking, no, Eliza, have some dignity, you know. Um, I, I think the question of, of mental illness is so culturally specific, like, in, you know, what they would have considered madness in, in 1814, so different from now. Uh, all I can tell you from reading Eliza's letters of 1814 is that the main symptom or, or troublesome behavior that troubled her, right, nobody locked her up. She, she went and found, she, she checked herself into a small private asylum. I would say her main symptom was anger. She sounds to me angry. She had quarreled with her guardian. She'd quarreled with Anne Lister. She'd quarreled with various people. And she, she seemed to be having up and down emotions. And nowadays you would just call this living. So she doesn't seem, you know, desperately dissociating or, or in desperate need of help to me, but she was behaving unacceptably. And while I don't think anybody locked her up in the first place, I think the fact that she, she didn't get, she hoped to get out, like her last letter to Anne Lister's at New Year in, in 1814 saying, very sorry for my recent madness and I'll be better soon, looking forward to coming out of, of the asylum. And then she doesn't. So I think, I think if she'd had a family, if she'd had a partner, if she'd had somebody arguing for her, she might well have recovered and, and come out of the asylum as many did. Um, so I, I think it, it proves her isolation in various ways and her racialized status is a huge part of that. Yeah, that's a thing. I mean, by, by the time she was in the asylum, she, she'd lost a lot of her community, right? Like her, her friendships had sort of disappeared, Anne Lister disappeared. So I, I think um, it would have been, it, it was hard. Yeah. She still had friends, but I feel that, you know, as long as she was behaving acceptably, everybody thought, oh, she's lovely. And then as soon as she, she was seen to be behaving wildly, I think that's when the racial stereotypes would have kicked in. I think people then would have been like, oh, the Asiatic temperament and the various you know, cliched ideas they had about instability or bad blood. And in her social circle, nobody mentions race except for this one moment when she's fighting with her guardian, when there are a couple of letters from a friend of his, Miss Marsh, that are suddenly explicitly and virulently racist, and they go on and on about Eliza's black blood. Um, so, so it's as if that moment when Eliza sort of lost her temper that year caused a rip in the social fabric, and suddenly all the unspoken racism bubbled up. You could, you could see for the first time people going like, oh, she's never been one of us, which makes sense to me of why Eliza was always so sort of anxious about need to keep my friends and need to please everybody and need to get good marks in school. You know, it was an impossible kind of life she was living, I think. Other questions? Santiago. Um, so, I want to, I'm trying to find a, the best way to fuse these two together, but in terms for both of you, what do you guys go about for finding that key factor, that element that pushes you to create something in terms of your creative research or your historical research? What is something that you guys look for um, to create whatever you guys are creating? If that makes sense. What an interesting question. Um, I think I would say I look for a question that I can't answer, and then it takes me a whole book to answer that question. Like if I had a simple solution to like, oh, I see why she went mad in 1814, 
then in a way, I, I wouldn't have enough curiosity to keep a novel going. Um, so it's often some very deep and, and perhaps unanswerable question that, that prods me. And it's also not a very rational process. I mean, I'm, I'm very rational in my planning of my books, but the kind of initial excitement is bodily. I get a rapid heartbeat sometimes when I encounter something in a museum or something in a newspaper, and I'm like, oh, there's a story there, and I can smell it. You know? So it's a, it's a bit like falling in love. Um, yeah, and I, I think for me, um, I mean, I, I, I always do turn to the past because I think the past um, can tell us a lot about the present. And um, I, I like to think that the past is never finished, that there's always different ways of interpreting it, of thinking about it, of reimagining it. And for me, it, it is the queer past that I'm interested in. So I'm always looking, a bit like Emma, I'm, I'm kind of looking for stories that speak to me um, that I can research, that I can go further in depth and, and try to understand why uh, the story has been invisible for so long, try and bring it into the light a little bit. And then in terms of the research, I know that the book has a lot of descript descriptive features in terms of the fashion. Um, so I just wanted to know whether that was like something that was brought from like letters or that was something that you had to dig deeper into like finding out in terms of the era? Oh, nobody's asked me about fashion yet. And, and this book doesn't have a lot of obvious fashion in it, but, but as with any of these areas, I would say, if you're only gonna choose three details, they need to be the right details. Um, so I was fascinated by the fact that like, the girls' uniform clothes, it wasn't quite a uniform, but it was a sort of a standard white frock thing, must have been so cold. I mean, even if in winter they were allowed the woolen version, these are still very delicate things that look like night dresses to us. And you know, those little wispy silk shoes, for instance. Um, so so the, the clothes you know, made me feel that the, the body of the schoolgirl was in this perpetually <laughs> frozen state. Um, and um, they had, um, well, another detail I found very interesting was that you had certain compulsory curls. Like the hair had to be all hidden under a mob cap, but you had to have the curls here. And there's a breakthrough moment when Anne Lister, who was just sick of trying to produce a few curls with, you know, wrapping them in paper and so on. She spots in a hairdresser a like clip-on, two curl thing. And she's like, yes, sorted. Um, which is like my brother-in-law when he realized that his daughter's in the Irish dancing circuit, he could just buy them a mop of red curls, sorted. <laughs> so um, yeah, I found that the curls interesting, the, the, the thin dress is interesting. Um, and um, also there was a fashion for bonnets that almost blinkered you. You know, and I, I was looking at those bonnets and I remember thinking, oh, I bet that Eliza Rain, as she goes through the streets of York, is just so conscious of people looking at her all the time. Um, and, and I imagined um, those, those blinkering bonnets as very characteristic of the time. So you might say that's only three details. There aren't lots of clothing scenes in the book, but they were the details I found really significant. And, you know, similarly say, I would have read books on the art of the time, and I don't put in long descriptions of paintings, but I found one particular thing that I wanted to use, which was, was a fashion for little paintings of just your beloved's eye. And they were sort of anonymous. It was like, ooh, I'm going to carry around a picture of my beloved, but you won't know who she is, you know? And I, but I just loved the kind of secrecy of like peeking through a keyhole. So I decided to use the lover's eye. And, and that's why the cover of the book is kind of a, an homage to the lover's eye. So, you know, you do quantities of research and then you only use a couple of little details, but those little details are so helpful. Hi, I'm Mike from the Village Bookshop in Bayfield. Uh, thanks for taking the time to do this. Uh, I wanted to know more about the collaboration. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit. So we have two authors writing on the same topic, and they're helping each other out over lunch. And I wonder if you could, because when I think of an author, I think of some solitary person away in a room somewhere. So uh, this is really unique what you guys are doing here with this book. These books, sorry. Thank you. I think it really helps to have, um, to be working on different things. You know, you notice we weren't both writing poems about Liza Rain simultaneously. Um, so we were working on very different genres and we have very different skills. And um, anytime I've helped Chris with her work, 
I am the most lowly grad student to her professor in that I, I literally just supply facts. I like I'd go to her, you know, and say, actually, it turns out it was on the 5th of July, not the 3rd of August, that Eliza Rain traveled to Halifax. You know, so just just tiny little facts. Um, and Chris, I would say, is able to squeeze more meaning out of um, a, a single text than, than anyone else I know. So she does all the sort of deep thinking and all the theory. I, I'm no good at theory. Um, but equally, if I need some theory to help me write fiction, like I remember when I was writing Room, I went to her and said, there's some guy with a mirror theory, isn't there? And she was like, yeah, Lacan, let me explain Lacan to you. So, <laughs> so she gives me the deep intellectual stuff. I help her out with some lowly facts. And then we each read each other's stuff. Yeah, I'm not sure I've ever been able to explain Lacan, actually, but uh, yeah, but we do, yeah, we do have different kind of brains, like I, I think we, we, we think differently about things, but we're interested in the same subjects, and actually when we first met, we stayed up all night talking about Richardson's Clarissa, which is the longest book in the English language, I think. We were the two so, losers at the party who'd both read it. <laughs> Strangely enough, nobody else wanted to talk to us about it. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it works. It works. Yeah. Hi. You mentioned oh, having... Oh. No, no, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you mentioned having a lot of help with the research and decoding the journals and things. I was just wondering, if you weren't able to continue that process and get new information, would you still have written the book or like how would that have looked? Oh, that's a great question. You know, once I knew that a couple of dozen letters between the two of them existed and were in Yorkshire, I think I would have had to wait for those letters. Yeah. Some of them had been published, but in a slightly garbled form. And there had been a, 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 a small self-published um, kind of biography of Eliza, which was no help because it was so full of things that looked like facts, but there turned out to be no evidence for them that it was actually harder than if there was no book about her published. So some of the letters existed in garbled form in that book, but um, I think I would have had to wait and get to the archive myself. Yeah, it was once I knew the sources were there because I'm trying to write a kind of fiction which is very, very factual. Whereas other people writing historical fiction, sometimes they're like, oh, it's all stories anyway, you know, or they'll deliber introduce deliberate anachronism. You know, that's a very different style of historical fiction. Whereas the kind I'm, I'm wanting to write is very much the, you know, the person who got a PhD kind of historical fiction. I, I really like trying to make it true and a good story at the same time. So yeah, I, I would have been delayed for years. Um, I'd have had to go to Yorkshire and just try and puzzle out these letters myself. And I'm not good at reading 19th century handwriting, not at all. Um, so, so I'm so hugely uh, grateful that I got the help with this one. You know, and again, with, with, um, with 19th century uh, legal sources, say wills, I mean, if you show me some 50 page will, I cannot find the key detail. Like I was trying to make each of the schoolgirls in their class in, an interesting character too. And so this, this genealogist, San Rick, and she found me little details about all of them. So one of them, for instance, one was called Margaret and she had a big fortune as well that her dad had left her. And I was trying to work out who her mother might have been. And San Rick and read his entire will and she said, you know, there's a maid that he says, I'll leave money to as long as she doesn't get married. I'm thinking, yes, that probably is Margaret's mother, because why else would he care whether his maid gets married? That seems very, like, you know, possessive from, from beyond the grave. So that's the kind of detail I just would not have found myself in those you know, bewilderingly long handwritten documents. So I am just so grateful to all the people who've contributed to my books, you know. Thanks for waiting. <laughs> That's okay. Actually, it's good that you took that other question right before because this is kind of a follow-up. I was wondering if, um, sort of taking a step back and thinking about the process, is there a tension between the people um, that have worked to crowdsource information and the academic side of things? Like, is there a is there a concern about academic rigor, or like you just mentioned, it's hard to read 19th century handwriting? Like, how do you how do you make sure the crowdsourcing people got it right? Uh, how do you fact check them? And is there a kind of you know um, reciprocal suspicion from the academic world that you know these people are not trained to do this and they're not reliable sources? And yeah. 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. And actually, one of the incredible things about this, this volunteer project um, is that it was set up by, by the, the archive itself, right? So the archive controls the project, first of all. That's West Yorkshire Archive Service. Yeah. And um, basically, the way it works, and correct me if I get some details wrong, but each, each volunteer, so there are 200 volunteer transcribers, and each volunteer transcriber will get given a page, scanned page of the diary, they will transcribe it, and then a second transcriber will go over it. So it, it gets checked twice, and, um, and then it goes online. So it's not a scholarly edition, definitely, and we are actually, the transcribers have done such an amazing job that actually there is a university press interested in making a scholarly edition. Now that will take years, but nevertheless, you know, so it, it, is, a, it is a controlled, transcription. And to be honest, you know, these volunteer transcribers, I mean, they're, they're a real range, you know, some of them are lawyers who are used to real detailed sort of documents. Um, some of them are just Gentleman Jack fans. But, but they're all, you know, they're, they're all very, very dedicated to, to the job. And because it's one page at a time, you know, they can spend time on it and they, they get very good at decoding the handwriting. Much, much better than I th either Emma or I could. The handwriting um, is much harder than the code. Yeah, the handwriting is The awful. code, she did like one little Lego piece at a time. It's very clear. Whereas the handwritten letters, it's cursive, so much harder to read. And sometimes cross-hatched, you know, to save on yeah. paper. But just to, to finish, the, you know, I think academics overall are delighted to have this, to have this transcription available. Um, I, I mean, I think we're just so grateful that... And, and some of the transcribers are academics as well, right? So it's, it, it's this range. But, but when we work on the scholarly edition, then that'll be, that'll be an academic university project. Um, but it, we can only do the scholarly edition because the transcriptions have already been done. Right. I can reveal there's a bit of tension about punctuation. Because some people think, you know, if I write out the words she wrote, then I'll add a full stop. That'll make it easier to read. And others are like, don't you add your full stop. That's not Ann Lister's full stop. But, you know, these are fairly minor tensions, and every community has its tensions. You know. Well, during the Ann Lister birthday week, it's all fun and games until we have the academic conference at the end. <laughs> Only lesbians could have drama over a period. Okay, one more question, and then we should we will continue the conversation, but over wonderful food and drink. There was a question over there. Yeah. Oh, I see two hands over there. Okay, you squeeze in. Okay, two quick questions. Quick, yeah, quick answers, rather. <laughs> Sorry, this um, just got me thinking about um, women's rights in that time frame that you're talking about, and you mentioned that uh, Eliza had money. And you also mentioned that Ann Lister had property, which I thought was kind of surprising that women were able to own property back then. Um, can you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, Eliza Rain had money because her father made huge money out in India, as so many men of the East India Company did. It was the biggest corporation in the world, and it basically brutally oppressed India. So um, he left the money to his two daughters. Um, Ann Lister had nothing at the time she was at school, but she inherited... Uh, this lovely house, Shipton Hall, from her uncle and aunt, who were both single people. And she inherited partly because they could tell she wasn't the marrying kind, so she wasn't going to leave it all to her husband. So perversely enough, she inherited the house probably because she was a lesbian. Um, so, so they're both very unusual cases, yeah. Where's the last one? Go ahead. Uh, this is a, a question for Chris. Um, thank you both. Can you tell us a bit about your conversation with Sally Wainwright? Um, it's such a, you know, it, it's it's moving into still new formal territory, and but I imagine nonetheless that you had lots to talk about. Um, yeah, and actually, uh, it, it's really Emma who did the interview with with Sally Wainwright, um, but. Uh, she, she, she's amazing. She, um, you know, she's been as obsessed with Ann Lister as, as we have been. And she wanted to, she really wanted to create a, a, an Ann Lister television series back in 2001. And uh, the BBC said, 
no way, nobody's going to watch this. Um, we don't have, you know, and, and Sally Wainwright herself wasn't famous yet. And then in 2019, after the success of Happy Valley, basically, uh, she went to the BBC and the BBC said, what can we do for you? She said, you can do Anne Lister for me. Um, and so she was able to create the series. But the other thing that she's done is um, she won the Welcome Fellowship Prize, the Screenwriting Prize, and she donated the entire prize to the Volunteer Transcription Project. So she helped make it happen. And it started right after Gentleman Jack, right? Yes, yeah, so if it's an extraordinary fandom, which is actually fed back into the scholarship, that's mostly because Sally Wainwright uh, set, set the tone. She, she wrote something which is very closely based on a diary, which most TV shows wouldn't be. And she has drawn huge attention to things like trying to find out where Anne Lister is buried within Halifax Minster. She's really focused everybody's mind on the archive. So she's, she's been followed then by this massive uh, fan following. So it's a, it's a unique situation, but I think it actually sets a model for how um, historical sources can, be, can, can become part of pop culture in the future. You know, it, it, it opens my eyes to a new way of doing things. Yeah, it's a, it's a great, um, great thing for a collaboration. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you.